Hello and welcome to another brief A-level psychology video. Today we're going to be looking at Schizophrenia Lesson 1. Okay, so this is the content that we are going to cover in this video as per the AQA spec. We need to know about the classification of schizophrenia. That means that you need to know what it is and you also need to know what the symptoms are and also how it is diagnosed. So that means we are going to be looking at positive symptoms of schizophrenia, we're going to be looking at negative symptoms of schizophrenia, and we are also going to be looking at a couple of diagnostics manuals very, very briefly. We're also going to be having a look at the reliability and the validity of the diagnosis and classification of schizophrenia, and that includes reference to things like comorbidity, culture and gender bias, and symptom overlap. And we're going to cover those mainly in the evaluation sections toward the end of the video. Uh, so, schizophrenia is a type of psychosis, a severe mental disorder in which thoughts and emotions are so impaired that contact is lost with external reality. Schizophrenia is the most common psychotic disorder, affecting about 1% of the population at some point in their lifetime, although it must be said that many who receive a diagnosis continue to lead a normal life after diagnosis and after subsequent treatment. Schizophrenia is most often diagnosed between the ages of 15 and 35, and it tends to affect men more than women. It's more prevalent in city dwellers and also in people of lower economic groups. Now, in order to make a diagnosis of schizophrenia, a clinician would use a diagnostics manual such as the DSM-5, the Diagnostics and Statistics Manual of Mental Disorders. The DSM is a classification and description of over 200 mental disorders, grouped in terms of their common features. It's mainly used in the US, where in, whereas in Europe, the ICD, the International Classification of Mental and Behavioral Disorders, is more commonly used. Both manuals have the characteristics necessary for a diagnosis of many, many disorders listed within it, including schizophrenia, although it must be said that unfortunately the criteria are slightly different depending on which manual you are using. So for example, the ICD-10 re requires two or more so-called negative symptoms of schizophrenia, whereas the DSM only requires one so-called positive symptom for a diagnosis. Now, as I just said, there are two types of symptoms for schizophrenia. Those are positive symptoms and negative symptoms. And all symptoms can kind of be grouped into these two separate camps. So we'll start with positive symptoms. Positive symptoms don't mean good symptoms. They mean an addition of an experience. So a symptom where you are gaining something that you didn't have before. An example of that would be hallucinations. So hallucinations refer to unusual sensory experiences that can be picked up from any sense. Sometimes they're related to the environment and sometimes they're not. So for example, people might uh, hear voices that are criticizing them or they might see uh, facial distortions or might see animals or people that aren't there. Another positive symptom is delusions. Now, delusions refer to irrational beliefs, and they come in a variety of forms. So, for example, a very common one is the belief that you are an important historical or political or religious figure, like Jesus or Napoleon. Those are called delusions of grandeur. But people also experience paranoid delusions, which are more about persecution, believing that people are watching you or are chasing you or are out to get you. Um, another common type of delusion is when people believe that a part of them or all of them is being controlled by an external source. So those are delusions of control. A final type of positive symptom is called disorganized speech, characterized by an inability to string together coherent sentences, or people who are suffering from disorganized speech might change topics mid-sentence without really thinking twice about it. So an example of disorganized speech is currently in the picture on the screen. Now moving on to negative symptoms. Negative symptoms re refer to the loss of an experience or the loss in ability or control over something. 
So an example is something called avolition, which is also sometimes called apathy. And this is where a sufferer struggles to begin or to keep up with goal-directed behavior. Three signs of avolition have been identified, and those are poor hygiene, lack of persistence in work and education, and lack of energy. Another negative symptom is something called speech poverty, and that is pretty much what it says on the tin. It is a reduction in the amount or in the quality of speech, and that's often accompanied by a delay in responses during a conversation. So as I mentioned earlier, part of this lesson is all about the reliability and the validity of the classification and the diagnosis of schizophrenia, which is something that we have to look at and we have to determine whether or not it is good or bad. Now, just as a quick recap for you, reliability refers to consistency or repeatability. So in this case, it refers to the consistency of a classificatory system such as the DSM or the ICD, or a measuring instrument to assess particular symptoms of schizophrenia. However, reliability alone counts for nothing unless the systems and scales are valid, and so validity refers to the extent that a diagnosis represents something that is real and something that is distinct from other disorders, and the extent that a classification system such as the DSM measures what it is claiming to measure. Now, there are several things that can get in the way of validity, and these are the things that we are going to be using in our evaluation points to determine whether or not the classification and the diagnosis of schizophrenia is valid and is reliable. So we have comorbidity, we have symptom overlap, gender bias, and culture bias. Now, I'm just going to give you a heads up. It is very, very possible that in an exam, you actually get asked to explain what each one of these things are. So in the evaluation points, I'll always make a point of saying this is what comorbidity is, this is what symptom overlap is, and so on. So I would recommend that you make a note of those things as individual definitions just in case something comes up where you have to explain what comorbidity is or what symptom overlap is or, you know, whatever. Okay, so let's have a look at these evaluation points and we are going to start with the issue of reliability. Now one problem with the diagnosis and the classification of schizophrenia is that it does unfortunately lack reliability. Now as I just said reliability refers to consistency and an important measure of consistency is inter-rater reliability which is the extent to which independent assessors come to the same conclusions regarding a diagnosis. And in some research done in 2009, two psychiatrists were independently asked to diagnose 100 patients using both the DSM and the ICD-10. And it was found that inter-rated reliability was poor. One of the psychiatrists diagnosed 26 patients with schizophrenia according to the DSM and 44 patients with the ICD, whereas the other psychiatrist diagnosed 13 with the DSM and 24 with the ICD. So there is massive inconsistency in terms of the diagnosis of schizophrenia, and that is a big limitation of the classification and diagnosis of this condition. Okay, moving on, the issue of comorbidity. Now, first and foremost, here is your definition. Comorbidity refers to the fact that two or more conditions could occur together. And if conditions occur together a lot of the time, then that calls into question the validity of the diagnosis and classification because there's an argument to be made that they may actually be a single condition rather than two separate conditions. Now, schizophrenia is very commonly diagnosed with other conditions. So in one review in 2009, it was found that around half of the patients with schizophrenia also have a diagnosis of depression or substance abuse. And that's just two examples. There are a lot of other conditions that are also diagnosed with schizophrenia. For example, PTSD is another one that's quite common. Now, that is a problem for the classification because it means that schizophrenia may not exist as a distinct condition. And that's a problem for the diagnosis because it suggests that some people diagnosed with schizophrenia may instead have just very unusual cases of depression, let's say. 
So that is definitely a limitation, and that definitely suggests that there is low levels of validity of the diagnosis and classification of schizophrenia. Again, symptom overlap is very, very similar. Symptom overlap is the occurrence of symptoms of schizophrenia and symptoms of another condition. So for example, both schizophrenia and bipolar disorder involve positive symptoms such as delusions and negative symptoms such as avolition. Now in terms of classification, just like with comorbidity, that suggests that schizophrenia and bipolar may not actually be two different conditions, but might instead be variations of a single condition. So in terms of diagnosis, that means that schizophrenia is hard to distinguish from bipolar disorder. So as with comorbidity, symptom overlap means that schizophrenia may not exist as a distinct condition. And even if it does, it's really, really hard to diagnose as we do things currently. So both classification and diagnosis are flawed. Okay, so coming to our final two points now, we have uh, the issue of gender bias. Um, and gender bias, if you don't already know, is the tendency to overdiagnose or underdiagnose um, one or the other gender. Now, unfortunately, men tend to get diagnosed with schizophrenia more than women. And the suggestion as to why that is comes from Cotton et al. in 2009, who effectively say that women are better at dealing with with things. So women tend to have closer relationships than men and so they therefore get more support. That then means that they function better on an interpersonal level because they are getting more support with what they're going through, which means that they may not necessarily get a diagnosis of schizophrenia where men with similar symptoms might um, get a diagnosis. So effectively, the better interpersonal functioning could bias practitioners to underdiagnose schizophrenia, either because symptoms are masked altogether, or because the quality of interpersonal functioning makes the case seem too mild to warrant a diagnosis. Okay, so that suggests that the validity of the diagnosis of schizophrenia is poor because our procedures for diagnosis only work well on patients of one gender. And culture bias works in a very similar way. So culture bias is this idea that one culture is over or underrepresented in the diagnosis of schizophrenia. And uh, research has shown that people of Afro-Caribbean descent living in the UK are up to 10 times as likely to receive a diagnosis compared to white British people. Although people living in the Caribbean are not more likely, which kind of rules out a genetic vulnerability. So the most likely explanation for it is culture bias in the diagnosis of clients by doctors from different cultural backgrounds. So for example, some symptoms of schizophrenia, particularly things like hearing voices, have different meanings in different cultures. Um, so in some Afro-Caribbean societies, voices may be attributed to communications from ancestors, let's say. However, when you walk into a doctor's office in a different culture, a practitioner might see those experiences as being bizarre or irrational and are therefore then more likely to give you a diagnosis of schizophrenia. That kind of problem appears to lead to an overinterpretation of symptoms in black people, um, which then means that Afro-Caribbean people may be discriminated against by a culturally biased diagnostic system. Um, which is obviously also a limitation of the validity of the diagnosis and the classification of schizophrenia. So, I know that I have given you a lot of information um, over the last 15 minutes or so, and I appreciate that a lot of it has been very evaluation heavy, um, which is unusual, the amount of evaluation points that we've actually had in this video. However, um, this is how schizophrenia has come up in the last couple of years since the new specification um, has taken over. And as you can see, there are short answer questions, there's application questions, and there's also essay questions. Um, so we need to make sure that we are covering all of our bases. So the first two just shows you how those individual key phrases like 
comorbidity and symptom overlap can just come up as a short two marker or maybe even a three marker. So it would be important for you to definitely know what each of these things are and have a little bit of a definition ready to go, which is what I was saying earlier. Um, you've also got your negative symptoms of schizophrenia, which could just as easily have been positive symptoms of schizophrenia in relation to um, a, an application stem. And so again, make sure that you know your symptoms, please. Um, the final one um, was an eight marker. It was a little bit tricky, but shouldn't be too hard. Um, so obviously you would have a three mark outline just on reliability and or validity. So you'd have to make a decision for yourself as to whether or not you could write a three mark outline on just reliability or just validity. And if you can't, then write an outline for both of them. So explaining what they are in relation to the diagnosis and classification of schizophrenia. Um, and then your evaluation section should be made up of two evaluation points for five marks. So if you are going to talk about both reliability and validity, then I'd obviously take one evaluation point for reliability. And then I would choose any of the evaluation points um, that we talked about for validity just to finish it off. Okay. Uh, right, so that is the end of the video. Uh, I hope it's all made sense. Like I said, it's been a fairly long one, um, but hopefully I've covered everything in a way that has been helpful. Um, and if you have any questions, then please feel free to pop them in the comment section below and I will do my best to get back to you. Thanks for watching and see you in the next one.